Okay, so I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about open cyber infrastructure for open society. And uh, the, uh, let's see, I, need, I think I need to, and I'm, I'm really going to uh, talk about three different topics as uh, anything that I, I say is, is wrapped around three challenges of sorts. And, and in all three challenges, while they are very generic and, and well applicable to life before JetGPT, I'm going to uh, uh, put a little bit of, a, of a, 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 a flavor into it that is AI influenced because that's what our challenge is these days. And uh, the first challenge is the gap between those who have and those who can't afford becoming uh, is becoming wider. And uh, that's a very standard statement, at least in the US, I don't know about Australia. And it is certainly true for cyber infrastructure. Um, and then and, uh, the second one is, uh, so how do we fit? How do we fix this? And the second one is how do we bridge the gap between classroom and research scale of any concept we teach? Um, uh, for example, I have an appointment in the yeah. Data Science Institute, and the Data Science Institute has a data science program. And my colleagues um, in data science talk when they talk about big data for a, a for a classroom, uh, hundred gig, ten gig, and and that's about as irrelevant as it gets. I don't want to hear about it. At the uh, at the uh, supervisor center, and so how do you go bridging that? You're teaching something rightfully at, without the pain of being at scale, and then how do you go and do things at scale? And the last one is um, that uh, the end of Moore's law is leading to a proliferation of architectures, and that's in some ways the part that I'm most scared about. Um, and how do we try and um, make domain science adaption easier, faster, given that what domain science really wants is stability and what technology industry is giving us is anything but stability. And I'm going to talk about that towards the last part. And they're all somehow challenges that we have a program that tries to uh, address all three of these challenges in one way or the other. And, and uh, I'm going to talk about that program most of the time. And uh, some of my slides sort of jump forwards between ideas, R&D and production. And I'll try to indicate this with these tags when uh, to sometimes, you know, to make it not too confusing. Um, and I, uh, as I said, I will look at these challenges using AI as a lens, but the challenges are far more general than that. In fact, much of what I see as trends today, really at UCSD started with, uh, with uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And uh, the fact that now AI uses the same hardware as the molecular dynamics simulation people have done for 10 years is sort of amusing if, in some sense. Um, uh, as as a, a, a reference, right now SCSC has uh, operates 3000 GPUs and 250,000 cores. Um, and the 3000 GPUs, two thirds is gaming GPUs because they were bought by faculty themselves. And, uh, and until very, very recently, none of our faculty wanted a, an A100 um, because the GRAM wasn't necessary. And only the LLMs have made that change, really. Uh, if you didn't have LLMs, I, I'd argue we'd still be buying uh, gaming GPUs for the future as well. And that's sort of one of the many challenges. Now, um, then the, the first statement is, and, and I stole this from Ian Foster, um, that at all but Pre-training is within the reach of, uh, I did, did, did I lose the slide? Oops, I, I um, had a slide in the wrong order. The first statement is pre-training is not for everybody anymore. And so what, I, what you're seeing here as a slide is uh, x-axis is time and y-axis is the percentage of the large-scale AI results that come from academia. And it starts in, in the 60s, the 60s, 80% was academic, right? And then something happened in 2010-ish and um, basically academia became irrelevant. And academia has become irrelevant because large scale AI is so compute intensive that nobody in academia can afford it anymore, to first order. So that's a problem. Um, and, and if you want, that's a, one extreme case of the fact that um, the gap is getting wider, even for institutions like UC San Diego. Um, basically, almost basically nobody in academia can compete with uh, the five companies that do AI these days. Um, uh, so uh, for the largest scale, so then what does it mean? 
Um, oops. Then I stole this slide from um, Ed Foster um, at, at, at SE Asia. And he has a nice way of categorizing different activities within AI. And he then gives you um, the, uh, in the notes, the scale at which you do that. And so the pre-training, that's where the uh, foundation models get created. We're talking thousands of GPU months of training. That's where nobody in academia can compete anymore. That's just it. That's just fact. Um, and, but if you then look at doing science with this, doing something useful, in other words, it's actually not that in at, at, uh, intensive by and large because there is, is a supervised fine tune, reward modeling, reinforcement learning, and all of these activities are sort of in the in one to 100 GPU days. And this is where academia still has a lot to say. And this is where the bulk of, I'd say the value is created in, in AI. Whereas this is sort of like, um, uh, it's the, like the electricity company. Somebody produces a piece of infrastructure that, you, that somebody has to do, somebody has to make this open. And then all of us will use that as a, as, as a core, like, an, like a programming language. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, or, the scale that is relevant to us is in the 100 GPU days of, or, or so, rather than in the 1,000 GPU months. And then, and so now that's just the AI angle towards an open infrastructure. I am for some time now been arguing that the, we need to address these challenges that I mentioned and that I'll talk about throughout this talk we need an infrastructure that is both horizontally open and vertically open. With horizontally open, I mean the obvious institutions can integrate their resources. I've been doing this for 20 some years, so it's an easy one for me to talk about. Um, the vertically open is what we haven't been doing for 20 some years, because that is something that is brand new as a capability, and I'll explain why. Vertically open means projects can build on the infrastructure if you think about it, Kubernetes and container deployments is not just technically different, but it's qualitatively totally different from what you're dealing with when you have a Sloan cluster. A traditional Sloan cluster, only the crazy people deploy services on a Sloan cluster with Sloan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's just hard, right? Whereas everybody, including industry, deploys uh, services by a container deployment mechanism like Kubernetes. And so vertical openness has become possible just like horizontal openness has been possible. And I'll talk about how we combine these two as a production infrastructure today. But where, where do I want to go? Long-term vision, I want to create an open national I'm funded by the US, so it has to be national, but in reality, I want to uh, create an open international um, uh, uh, sub infrastructure that allows the federation of CI at all 4,000 accredited degree crowning higher education institutions. Now, the US is a very strange country in that, uh, for many reasons. So um, uh, <laughs> and, and, and one of the strange things is that academia is very bifurcated. There's, there is like literally 3,900 accredited uh, institutions of higher learning in the US. And um, I'll talk more about that in a moment. And so what I want this open summer infrastructure to be, or how I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it as another one of these open words. We have open science, we have open data, we have open source. And I think we must have open infrastructure. And open infrastructure just means that you can build on it horizontally and vertically. And uh, in, in the best analogy that I know of is the internet. The uh, research and education internet is basically an open infrastructure. Every game we plug in, there's certain rules for the, of the game and there's certain technologies that everybody has to use, but everybody can plug in and you can build on it. And then you can make some of it private, some of it public, da 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 da, -da. It's policy driven once the plumbing is in place. And that's what I want to achieve for compute, storage, um, data access, which for me means content delivery networks and open devices, instruments, IoT, you name it. Basically anything that has some computational device or some data in it should be integratable in some ways into this open infrastructure. And uh, voila, then it gets corny, openness for an open society. And um, so here's the map 
of the 3,900 accredited institutes of higher learning of the US. It's basically mirrors more or less the map of the population density in the US. And um, they come in all shapes and sizes from a few hundred to a few tens of thousands of students. The largest uh, uh, campuses in the US have um, 50,000 students or so, um, and maybe a little more, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, UCSD has 42,000 students and some change. Um, it's now uh, by far the largest uh, uh, UC by student count, as far as I know. And now uh, there is, of course, there is the angle that you need to be able to empower all of those if you want to maximally benefit for academia in the US. That's a, in, in a way a national prerogative. And then you have another prerogative and that's just sort of the the uh, um, uh, DEI, EDI, whatever um, uh, uh, notion. And for me, that is really driven by, uh, I can't predict where the next geniuses come from. They might be lying, they might be born anywhere. And if I want to maximize um, uh, the, uh, the impact um, on humanity uh, or the way that we live or solving problems, I need to be allowing everybody to have a chance to actually get educated. And that brings me towards wanting to reduce the gap. Um, now, if, if you're this crazy, um, wanting to build an infrastructure of 4,000 uh, uh, that can be, a, a, where you can do this kind of thing, open infrastructure across 4,000 institutions, then the m immediate uh, thing that comes to mind is that you cannot possibly envision that as one project. Doesn't make, make any sense. It's not going to be a funded project by some funding agency because it, that, it, it's just too big. And so you have to think of it differently. You have to think of it as a community with a shared vision. So the community, and I'm basically a, a talking about this everywhere I go because I want to create that shared vision. And then you have to think of it as the funded projects are these panels where each and every one of these projects may have a very small overlap with that community vision. And most of the scope of the project is outside of that vision. And they all have different scopes. Therefore, they justify themselves, but they have an overlapping scope in order to actually make the vision work. And this is what I'm aspiring to. And we're sort of doing this right now. And um, there's a number of pro funded projects that we have that follow this notion. Um, there is an Open Science Data Federation, Open Science Compute Federation, National Data Platform, Fusion Data Platform for AI, and, um, and then there is, is IE platforms for multiple campuses. So we're starting to create this and implement this within the context, the technical context that I'm going to talk about next. And literally, the hardware that you would see integrated at Maps from comes is funded by anything that you want. Um, there's NNF funding, DOD, DOE, da 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 da. It's, it's um, individual faculty funding from startups. Etc. 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 Now, um, let me again go to the AI. The advent of JetGPT has really redefined academic infrastructure needs, and in my mind, it has accelerated something that was already happening. And I'll show you well, the evidence for that in a moment. Basically, over the last few years, even before JetGPT, more and more. Um, uh, at least in my campus, uh, entire divisions have realized that we need to put at the core of our curriculum a programming language so that we, it, we converge early on some programming language and then the entire curriculum can build on all the kids knowing how to program in that language. Um, in, at UCSD for biology, for the division of biology, this is R. For uh, physics, this is Python. And They've just chosen this, and then now they're building. They're building curriculum around that choice. And that then leads to infrastructure that is actually research infrastructure. I mean, computing infrastructure, cyber infrastructure that is used in the classroom and no longer just in the research. You don't go and, and you can no longer divorce classroom teaching from cyber infrastructure for a, an ever increasing number of courses. And AI has made that have just accelerated this, this general trend. And I'll, I'll show you some examples later. And 
that then gives you total new challenges. I claim that the majority of calls in the USA are too small for a data center. I do not believe that there are 3,900 data centers at these 3,900 institutions. Because when I look around, some of these small institutions that I know, they don't. They don't have the capability. Um, and most colleges that have data centers aren't prepared to host modern hardware in the data center. That's the kind of stuff we talked earlier, right? Um, uh, anything I new and interesting that we buy at SAC today is, uh, is dark to cheap liquid cooled. Um, and so that kind of infrastructure doesn't exist even in the data centers that exist. Um, and then, then even, if, even if they have power and cooling, the price per rack has exploded. And, and so they say there is a power density explosion and a dollar density explosion. And we don't know how to deal with either um, by and large. And, and that's true, not just for small institutions. That is also a challenge for the juggernauts like UC San Diego. UCSD is 1.8 billion research expenditure per year, last year. So uh, it's a, an enormous colossus of an institution. So one of the things we need to do, we need to uh, uh, do R&D focus on reducing the total cost of ownership of cyber infrastructure for AI, but really off cyber infrastructure for anything. And that's where, where what we're focusing on in the National Research Platform. The National Research Platform is a, is, is a different thing for different people watching it from different directions. And one of the directions is very clearly focused around um, the vision of doing this vertical and horizontal openness. And the other one is reducing total cost of ownership in order to allow smaller entities to participate, meaning democratization of access. And, I, I, and uh, both of them are accomplished by the same identical technical means. And that is our software stack, ultimately. Um, so we have a flexible architecture to build on horizontal and vertical. And the architecture is very simple. At the bottom is the hardware. Then we have up IPMI, firmware, and BIOS. Then we have Kubernetes. Then we have Admiralty in some cases when needed. Um, and then Slurm and all the way on top, OSG and Path. And what's the rationale here? The rationale for it, having a stack like this is we want to be offering, let me restate. The one thing I learned in 20 years of distributed computing, uh, trying to integrate in different institutional uh, cyber infrastructure is that there's no such thing as one size fits all. Um, it is incredible what the diversity of requirements people come with. And when you think about it, the only rational way of thinking about it is that different places require, for whatever reasons, different levels of control. And control costs money. That's just fact. If you want more control, you have to be willing to invest more into people because people exert control, they produce that control at some level. If you need maximum control, then you have to own your own batch system. You have to own your own storage system. That costs you a lot of money because the people that will manage that cost money. If you're willing to give all of it up and are willing to have somebody else run by IBMI the hardware that you own, voila, all you have to buy, buy is the hardware and you're done. Hardware, plug it in, cable up the network, hand it over. And so what we're trying to do with this part, with this stack is give people different layers where they can choose What's my comfort level, socially, politically, whatever, um, that I want to be plugging in so that I can grow the horizontal? And we literally, this all works. Um, the only part that is sort of, of not production, because we don't have enough customers, is the Admir Admiralty Federation between Kubernetes clusters. But we do it, uh, some amount at IPMI, we do some amount at Kubernetes, meaning people give us IPMI access to their hardware around the world so that we run everything from IPMI up. We people give us, join our Kubernetes cluster and give us therefore root at the very basic level. Um, and then we run everything else, but they run the base operating system. Uh, and, and, um, and, so, uh, and then people run everything themselves and just join with us via OSG and part. They said the batch, uh, batch layer or the storage layer. And what NRP ultimately is, NRP is a non-like local extendable container deployment platform. And we created it because of this vision. And once we created it, we realized, whoops, 
we've actually done something that is way more powerful than what we had bargained for because this layer is so much more powerful than slurm because you can now also support vertical building. We can support other people building CI on top of ours simply by deploying their container infrastructures in interesting new ways that uh, wasn't imaginable on Slurm. And so let me give you one example. The Open Science Data Federation is literally an application deployed on an IP. Now, if you think about it, when if you want to do a content delivery network, if you want to optimize for access, data access, and, and uh, then you need a certain structure that is, is, is very obvious. You need to have storage somewhere. We call that a, a, um, a, a, uh, an origin. Anything that, is a, that has data is an origin. And then you need caching. And then you need some kind of software that makes least recently access or some kind of algorithm like this so that your cache accesses are and cache means that uh, are treated with rationally. And that's basically what we built. And every C here is a cache. Every O is an origin. And as you can see, we are even in Australia. We have presence in Australia, in Korea, Japan. Um, this is uh, Singapore. Um, so they said, and much of this, not all of it, but much of this uses NRP because the caches are best situated in the internet network backbone. So a lot of our caches, most of our caches are actually at POPs. Um, they are POPs of ether, in, in ESnet or Internet2. And given, because that's sort of a, a very convenient way of locating things, we have in the US, we have a cache. There's, in the continent US, there isn't a spot that uh, has more than 500 miles from to the closest cache. So there's therefore, and the, the caches, I literally, in order to get this funded, I took the map of the United States, made circles of 500 miles, found the smallest tessellation that everything's covered in 500 miles. And the 500 miles was given by, it was good enough uh, latency uh, to uh, make it work. And then we uh, plopped down and, and put caches in. Um, we have caches of the major pops in Europe, we have caches in, 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 uh, in Singaran for Asia. And so we're sort of, deploying this out. This here is the map of the Kubernetes infrastructure that we operate. So every flag here is a piece of hardware in location that is inside our Kubernetes cluster. Meaning these are the people that have basically given away root to us. And you can see it's all over the, uh, the world. There's a clear overlap like here, um, here, these two you saw as caches on the previous slide. Um, some of these are, are caches on, on uh, so some of these entries into our Kubernetes infrastructure are actually caches for this application. So the people who wanted to build this then came with their friends who were willing to host caches. And then those caches ended up in NRP in order to build this thing on top. So right there, you're building this, this core vision and you're building out the flower. And then if you look at it from the institution joining at the batch of storage layer, then you get this map. And you get at this point when, um, within OSG, we have 143 institutions. Within NRP, there is uh, in the neighborhood of 40 institutions or so. Um, I don't know, have the exact count. Um, and there's some amount of overlap. And we haven't sorted out the overlap yet, but within our conceptual architectural model, we have more than 150 institutions right now horizontally connected. That's not too bad. So I'm one order of magnitude away from the 4,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I work with one and log scale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then bridging education and research by having them coexist on one platform. And so basically, in order to, one of the other, so, so we've already seen two things, how we done magic for virtual Kubernetes. One is that we could actually grow this 
horizontal, and two, that we grow this vertical. Now, the third one is that we can also do education and research on the same platform. And, um, and the, what, what's, what's happening is that a lot of the smaller colleges care more about education than research use. That was one of the things that I didn't expect that sort of came out once we started engaging with smaller institutions. There's a lot more need for education and allowing the kind of educational things that I've talked about um, than research, because most of those small institutions don't have much of research, uh, but they have a hell of a lot of education. And so one of the things that we do with the NRP is we support education. I'll talk about this in a little bit. And I don't, I don't want to go too much into details. I'm going to give you three examples, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, how this works for one of them. So there is the University of Oklahoma Libraries presented, and, and in my actual PDF, you can just click on these and go to the real thing and uh, learn more about it. And I'll, I'll, I'll send you the uh, uh, PDF later. Um, the University of Oklahoma actually built something on NRP without us even knowing. Um, basically, the people who run NRP didn't know what they were building until we saw the talk. And the, the talk was not presented to us it was presented to, to the, uh, their peers, the library community, um, and uh, at a CNI, uh, CNI meeting, CNI 2022. And that's one, that's my favorite example of success, right? If somebody else does something using what you've uh, created, you weren't even thinking about it, and voila, uh, success. Um, another one is the Great Plains, the Great Plains Network Organization is a regional network in the US that covers the Great Plains basically the Midwest, um, and they ganged together with well, institutions across seven states, wrote an NSF proposal, got that funded, and are now doing, in, in, uh, deployed mostly GPUs with a strong focus on uh, supporting STEM education, especially AI. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then we have something where we're working together with Scenic. Scenic is the regional network provider for the California. California has um, the uh, UCs, there's 10 of us, and then he has the state universities, there's 23. Out of the state universities, 21 are Hispanic serving institutions. Um, and they have served a total of 460,000 students. Half of all bachelor degrees in the state of California come out of that system. That system is a system of small institutions in terms of small budgets. They're not our ones, they're not research institutions. And we're working with Scenic, the regional network provider, on bringing AI education to those 23 institutions as part of this project. And here is an example of the GP engine. This is the states we're talking about institutions. It's seven, it's institutions across seven states in the Midwest, um, and Nebraska, South Dakota, I'm not even sure that I get them all right, Kansas, Missouri, um, Arkansas, um, uh, that's Oklahoma, I think. And I'm not sure what that is. Um, <laughs> whatever. Um, so, and, and they've basically built on top of NRP their own infrastructure. They own it and they use it as an educational infrastructure to teach computer science. It started with teaching computer science classes and then it sort of migrated to AI, etc. And they basically use these kinds of tools. And ultimately, everything is on top of Kubernetes, and that's where we then provide the base infrastructure. Um, I now have wanted to give you a little bit um, what educational computing at UCSD is like today. UCSD saw what we were doing on the national scale and then realized that this is incredibly valuable for locally. So they took a copy, a carbon copy, funded that for themselves. And this is what UCSD runs at its uh, educational infrastructure. Um, totally insanity, if you ask me, but at UCSD, the money for education shall never in the mix with money for research. And as a result, you have to have an independent infrastructure of education from the infrastructure of research. I can't help it. Um, but what's interesting is that this infrastructure for, for, uh, for education then has become extremely uh, 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 used. These are the different schools. Um, this is engineering, social science, data science, 
biological science, physical sciences, I'm, I'm not sure what those professional schools are, marine science, basically SIO, arts and humanities, and uh, extended studies, I think, is, is, um, uh, is, um, is the, uh, the adult education program. Um, so all over the map, and in, in, uh, it's a small cluster. It's all, on my slides, I say 30 bit GPUs. Whenever you see 32 bit GPUs, it's a, it's a, a synonym for gaming GPUs, the first order, um, uh, because those are the cheapest. Um, there's 140 gaming GPUs. Um, during FY23, this was used by 6,500 undergrads and uh, close to 2,000 grad students. In 33% in of all of the pods that were run were in some way or, or the other clearly identified uh, as AI. But that still leaves you with two thirds, and it's 53 courses across eight schools. It's enormously pervasive. That's where I believe that this was already there, the need was already there. AI just made it worse. And this is the kind of thing that was taught in 2023. And I've, I've put in, in light blue, the kind of courses that are clearly AI relevant, but then there's all these other things that are not obvious that they're AI relevant at all. Um, and so there is sort of a, a nice mix across, um, AI is accelerating a trend that already existed prior is my statement. And I, uh, how am I doing with time? Ah, okay, fine. Now I'm good. Okay. Now, now, now I'm good. I wanted to because I don't want to uh, get. I don't want to. Uh, I want to have time to get to the third issue of what does Moore's Moore's law do to us? Um, and uh, but before I get there, I want to talk a little bit about what AI looks like at, at UCSD because as UCSD is a very large place, and it's not just a large place. It's also more Balkan than, um, uh, than uh, China, let's say. Um, it's not very well organized. Or, well, it is very well organized, but it's very federated. Um, basically, everybody does whatever they freaking please, the first order. <laughs> um, and uh, as long as you have the money, given that, this, given that the, there's no central money to influence what people do, everybody does whatever they can fund. And so there is a, a, a certain degree of, of um, it's often hard to understand what the hell is going on at the uh, university. And so what we did in order to figure out a little bit what's going on, the one thing that is common, most people use STC, not everybody, but most people use STC one way or the other. And so what we did is we looked across all of our systems and searched across all projects that we know about, and then did a, a literally a regular expression search of sorts for AI, ML, uh, computer vision, that kind of, of stuff, in order to find who do we have had, who does AI on our machines. And so when we did this very recently in December uh, uh, last year, and then we found more than 60 faculty, and we put faculty in, in quotation marks, basically a, a PIs, um, across 23 departments engaged in AI at, at, or ML at SAC. To me, that was stunning. 23 departments in the university are engaging in AI ML today, uh, well, last year um, at, at UC San Diego. That's a large number. Um, and then, and, uh, then I, I looked at that, this, uh, asked myself, so where do they come from? What's the predominant? Where's the most of the AI being done? Well, computer science has the most PIs that do AI. Obvious, that's understandable, right? Then SEC is next. That's also understandable to some degree. Oceanography, that was a little bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, there's actually a story behind this that I get there. And data science, it's probably not that surprising. At uh, UCSD, data science is now a synonym for AI, for first approximation. Um, and uh, then the one where it really got weird is cellular and molecular medicine. I didn't even know that such a thing existed, really. Nor do I really know what they, they do in that department. But that department had five uh, researchers that do AI ML. Um, and and then similar radiation medicine, that's a little bit, radiation medicine are the people who basically do computer vision uh, or apply computer vision uh, because they, they're analyzing and, and pictures. Um, and so when I then dug in and tried to get my head around this, I then analyzed it by divisions. And again, schools all over the uh, campus. And what in the end came out is that 
we find that engineer and health sciences account for roughly a quarter of their researchers each. In other words, already now I see from the ground up a very strong thrust for AI in health at UC San Diego, which is driving part of the bulk of what's going on in AI and health. And it's happening both in engineering and in the medical school. And it's happening sometimes across the two. And that's sort of an interesting finding of, of when you're trying to ask yourself, where is, where is all this happening? Um, and now I'm gonna to switch to the last question. And the basic question, uh, the way I formulated the question is, how the hell are we gonna deal with the end of Moore's law, right? End of Moore's law made it, is, is um, we see less and less uh, bang for the buck increasing as we, uh, time goes by. And that leads to a plethora of architectures and what I'm trying to do with NRP, given its software stack that I've explained to you, and given the power in the software stack, and given the both horizontal and vertical openness, I'm trying to build the computer science toys into the infrastructure so that the infrastructure itself is a social attractor for both the domain scientists and the computer scientists and the engineers. And therefore, as I bring CSR&D and domain science R&D onto the same platform, I'm hoping that social cohesion will accelerate domain, domain exception. And uh, so that's basically the, the big idea, so to speak, and we'll see whether I'll have any success. And so NFP blurs the line between traditional test beds and production CI. And, <laughs> and that line is almost hardwired in the agencies in the US, um, where production CI is funded out of the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, and test beds are funded out of size. While OSC is inside size, it has its own budget, and the two trains shall not meet, typically. And so NRP is conceptualized to break that open and make that sort of closer together. We have actually funding of both size, and we have funding if you think again, this common vision and then the pedals, some of these pedals come from size and some of these pedals come from OSC. So we have to produce a production infrastructure for all domains and we have to produce a computer science infrastructure interesting for computer scientists only. And so, uh, uh, um, uh, and this is actually, this, this is designed to be so. So there is, is an idea behind the madness. And so where does this come from? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I am influenced by um, uh, people like John Schalf, uh, who's I think still the, the uh, head of the uh, computer science department at Berkeley Labs. And, um, and by people like the uh, Mark Pepermaster, the CTO of AMD. And so I took these two slides from these two people and John already in 2020, put this in a paper where he's basically arguing uh, Moore's law is done. Uh, and at the end of Moore's law has come, uh, the, 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 there is, is no more uh, uh, real improvements uh, to be had. And um, all improvements in the future come from architecture uh, because uh, the, or the bulk of the improvements come from architecture. And um, Mark Pegelmaster says the same thing, but says in much more marketing speak um, because he's from a company. And his marketing speak is um, and I, uh, it's this plot, which is basically has two axes of no meaning. Um, but that's uh, okay. It's having a symbol, all right? <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a picture. It's art. Um, it's applications and performance per what? Uh, and and the, the notion is, but nevertheless, I actually like this a lot because it's very powerful a picture. It's powerful art. And the powerful art is that general purpose CPUs are very broad application space and have very poor performance for what? Then if you go to GPUs, it narrows significantly. There is not nearly as broad an application uh, um, space for GPUs, but it has better performance for what? And if you then, and the future, Mark Papermaster, the CTO of AMD is claiming, is in domain specific architectures, and domain specific architecture for me means FPGAs, ASICs, da 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 da. And this is 
very, very narrow application space, but the best possible performance for what that you can get given the amount of silicon that you have. And I believe that there's something here that this is the solution to that at some level. And I see that when I look at, use, at, at UCSD as an exemplar, when I just look at what do people do, what are people interested? And the kind of example is uh, there, there is a, a, a project, a set of projects is called Jump 2.0. It's funded by the, uh, what the hell does SOC stand for? Semiconductor Research something. Um, uh, it's basically a, a, a um, semiconductor uh, organization of all the big companies. And they bring money together and they give grants out according to, to stimulate work in a direction where they think they need for their industry. So the same kind of industry itself is basically putting its own money on the table in order to do this. And, and the, the, uh, one, the, one of my co-PIs, Tayana Rosing, who is a, a computer science faculty at UCSD, has a grant of $50 million uh, uh, from, from this organization, PRISM, uh, the PRISM crowd, and they're funded to be doing health science on FPGAs or other new architectures. And I'm committed to, the way I look at it, is that MS, NRP supports FPGAs, um, P4 switches, and NVIDIA DPUs and AGXs to create a playground of interesting hardware to be attractive for computer science research, or electroengineering research, or the research in the middle of the two. And with the eye towards that ultimately I want the main specific architecture advanced and the adoption advanced in the domain by virtue of people having social coherence and maybe meeting each other via the platform. And uh, we'll see how well it works. I have one other uh, uh, slide from John Charles from, uh, from a talk they gave at SC23. And I like this a lot because it's particularly um, disturbing. Um, now, what is this? This now is real access and, and, and real meaning. Um, this here is the a, a, a multiplication factor that you get for the um, totality of the top 500 uh, uh, computed uh, systems. In other words, you go through the top 500, sum up all of the compute uh, uh, capability of those top 500 systems, and then ask yourself, what was that 11 years ago? What is it today? Divide the two, and that's the y-axis. And then the x-axis is just time. And sometime around 2012, there was sort of roughly flat. That means a stable exponential. Moore's law was fully intact. And then all hell broke loose. And since then, we've basically been decaying. And uh, the, that's actually a, a, a pretty impressive two orders of magnitude decay here around today, it's about 10. 10 is still a pretty large uh, improvement over time, over 11, but it's 11 years. You got a factor of 10 in the top 500 in the last 11 years. You used to get a factor of 1,000 in 11 years in the top 500. And that kind of thing tells you in a more dramatic way what the previous page or, or, or this slide tells you where you're just looking at Moore's law ending, right? Because this here means that if you're banking on doing more science in the future, because more hardware will be as cheap as it is today, you're screwed. That's not happening. It's not happening like it used to. And that is actually a dramatic statement. And you know, the funny thing is that at SC23, John talked about this because he, that's what his job description now. His job description is architecture of post exascale for the DOE. Um, so he needs to talk about this. But the other person who talked about this was um, the NVIDIA rep, um, Tom Gibbs. And Tom Gibbs gave a presentation in the uh, uh, SDSC booth where he basically said that um, Moore's law is dead. And the only way that you scientists are gonna get advantage is through AI because all your future gains come from surrogate models. And if you want to scale up, you can no longer just brute force scale up like you're used to for the last 20 years. 
Now you have to be actually totally changing the algorithms because the algorithms is the only place where you can really win. And, and that is actually a very scary, those two statements, if you take all of this together, and I'm not making these statements, I'm just parroting. Um, when you take the statement of an academic, a, a CTO of a big company, a representative of Invidia, which of course have the good reasons to say this, um, and, and um, there's something emerging here that I also see in the marketplace. So when I look, what can I buy, right? What do the vendors want to sell me? And, and when I look at what the vendors want to sell me, I find that pretty much every single dumb device that I know that I'm used to now exists in a variant that is externally programmable. It doesn't matter what device, take whatever you want. It's the NICs, it's the, it's the storage devices, it, it's the disks, it's the switches. Um, all of the core devices that we're thinking of when we're thinking of architecture and cyber infrastructure, all of them now are externally programmable. They exist in a variant that is externally programmable. And then if you look at this, these, each one of these actually comes with not just external programmability, but it comes with entire architectural thinking, meaning it comes with different way of thinking about what you want to do. And so it, let me just walk you through this. Storage devices with embedded FPGAs, um, uh, do you have it on here? Um, Silent smart SSDs from, I think Samsung, if I remember correctly. Um, they come with the concept of computational storage. There's a whole lot of small startups who are trying to make a killing on, in that area. And basically are saying, we want to put smarts, algorithmic smarts, all the way to the storage devices. Decisions should be made on the storage itself. Next, GPUs on network interface cards. Or oh, it doesn't have to be GPUs. There's GPUs, FPGAs, there is um, custom architectures. There's at least two, three companies that are in this business some of them have been bought already and no longer exist. Uh, basically, there's an enormous amount of activity in the, in the uh, industrial space on computability on network interface cards. NVIDIA is in this game with a vengeance, despite the fact that they're not making any, I don't see anybody, I see exactly one product out in, 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 uh, that you can buy that actually uses that. And uh, we can talk about what that is. But it's a, it comes with a different kind of thinking the think of data flow programming. ESnet is actually thinking along those lines now with a vengeance when they're conceptualizing streaming from uh, large facilities of the DOE into high HPC systems. And they're thinking about this as data flow programming um, on, on NICs and assemblies on NICs when they get to POPs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you're getting down to the third example, programming switches and down to individual ports. Um, and all my 400 gig switches that I actually, all the, uh, the 400 gig switches that I individually as a PI own um, are P4 uh, programmable switches. And so there is an emerging research area, or, or there's a research area that has emerged among the networking people where they're trying to think about how do can, where does that leave us? White air network P4 switching, and programmable switches is why a network-based flow programming with SDN and so forth is emerging. And there's a lot of very interesting stuff that's going on there that's changing the way the world works in, in some ways. And I think I see that all of this is happening simultaneously. I do not believe that anybody has a freaking clue which of these three will actually win and which one will die or be a niche player and be not relevant for most of what we do in some infrastructure. But it means that there's an enormously active set of thinking, the intellectual pursuit, that ultimately has to be adopted into the domains. Somewhere along the lines, something useful has to come out of this. And, and that sort of is where, where, where I see NRP maybe providing value, because it brings the, the people who are intellectually exploring this onto the same platform as the people who actually want to benefit from this. And maybe these trains will meet. 
And I want to give you one example of what I'm doing myself. So, so I myself am, uh, am, I have to admit, I'm a, a, in one of these people who have an embarrassment of riches. And uh, so I own, I don't own it. I, I'm, I'm a benefactor of a donation of Arista switch. I have a 400 gig Arista switch in the LA pop. That means I, have, I control 32 ports in the LA pop to peer with anybody who arrives in LA um, at 400 gig. If you want to experiment with me at 400 gig, be my guest. I'll give you a pop for free. Um, and so, so that's the kind of, of, of embarrassment riches. I then have a 400 gig connectivity from that switch directly into the SDC data center and into the core NRP FPGA juggernaut. F, uh, they said a, a segment of NRP that has eight HEXs and HEXs is NVIDIA's uh, reference platform for eight, eight, 180 gig. So we have 64 uh, A100s packaged in HEXs at SDC with 400 terabyte of NVMe with 32 signings U55Cs, all in one thing, in basically two racks worth. And it's all connected up to the outside by a four, P4 protocol with four gig switch. And so we're building this, this playground, if you wish, a playground for, for people who want to do interesting and weird stuff, uh, crazy things. And, uh, and that, this is part of this. And then we're connecting all of this up to LA. And we're, we're just now started peering in LA with ESnet at 400 gig, with Fabric at 400 gig. We're planning on peering with Pussy Wave at 400 gig so that we can then do, go anywhere in the world at 400 gig, a, a dedicated 400 gig all the way into the SSC data center. And so, so uh, if, if there's, and, and of course, we have right now exactly one project that is actually using this. And of course, that's not going to use it all the time. So I can actually, it's easy for me to offer this to people because I'm not using it all the time. Uh, and, and I have it dedicated. I'm not sharing with anybody. I have a dedicated 400 gig to Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, and what do I do with it? Why do I have this? Um, that's because it's, I can actually use it. I've used it, it uh, I've sent 400 gig around. And um, I believe, well, actually, just let me say this differently. I'm sick and tired of commissioning global transfer infrastructure via regular networks. It's a pain in the ass. It's an enormous amount of human effort. And it never gets really used at the level that it's paid for. Meaning, while I may have paid for 100 gig all the way to my high energy physics cluster, I basically never, it never works at 100 gig, first order, because uh, I don't even know who's not performing. And the fundamental disconnect is that nobody on the network is telling you what are they promising, because nobody actually promised you anything. The network is fundamentally Wild West. Its architecture is Wild West. It's it's whoever screams the loudest, grabs the hardest, uh, is the closest, gets whatever is there. That doesn't make any sense conceptually. Um, and given that I have to build for exas exabyte computing in the LHC, I'm, I'm, my own science is the large Hadron Collider, as, as David, I still do this on, on, in my copious spare time. <laughs> um, and so, so we have to build for moving exabytes around. Um, if you want to move exabytes around, you can't commission over provisioning by orders of 10, factors of 10 anymore. That doesn't make any sense. And so I want to build, and I want to build a fundamentally different internet. And I want to build an internet where the fundamental philosophy is to build a system where the network makes bandwidth promises up the stack. So the stack at the top, where you want to move data around because you have objectives, you have signed objectives. And those signs objectives get turned in have priorities. And you will say, this petabyte should move from here to here and pronto. Um, and, and I want to then go to the network and say, give me the best you got. And the network gives me a promise. And it promised me, you're going to get 150 gig for the next 10 hours, two days, three, one week, unless I tell you otherwise. And the key to me is not that I can make reservations. 
because the future is not predictable and the future is uncertain and the future always changes. The key to me is that at any moment in time, there's a promise that I can check on that is actually fulfilled. And I can go back and say, you promised me X and you delivered Y. Why are you not performing? Today in today's networks, nobody can do that because nobody knows what's the promise, what's supposed to happen. And so, so this is where I'm, I want to go. I want to have, and I'm working on this together with, with um, ESNet. And ESNet is committed. ESNet is an interesting thing, organization because ESNet fundamentally only has to serve the DOE. And that means they have a contained scope. And that allows them to do things like this much more easily than anybody else. And so ESNet is, it has, in the manga, the head of ESNet is committed to providing 75% of his total network bandwidth by in form of promises and 25% the way that it's done today and achieve that in some future time. And so he's committed to work with us to figure out how to do this. And then once we have figured out how to do this, we will give the top ESNet users the APIs to adjust to. And we're already building it around pieces that the top users use meaning we're building it, we're, we're uh, uh, doing this on this test bed, but at the same time using the software artifacts that are actually in production use. So that we, our concept is that take the production software, change it a little bit so that it can do this, put glue in place so that you can actually implement a PI that you fully control. And then over time, when you've proven that what you're doing makes sense, then move the glue in either up the stack or down the stack so that somebody else owns it so that it can be part of the production system. That's the logic. And so, and, and this is basically what we're trying to do with, the, with my uh, testbed infrastructure. And it's supposed to be uh, helping us move exabytes around for the LC. Summary, last slide, conclusion. NFP has a very ambitious mission, vertically open, so horizontally open, vertically open, the playground for CSRD in order to mitigate the, uh, the uh, mayhem caused by the end of Moore's law. And then uh, there is a, the recent obsession with AI acceleration prior trends. And uh, we are off to an excellent start. I would say for uh, NRP was officially um, uh, funded, I wanna say March 3rd, 2023. But it has legacy that it builds on and therefore has had an enormous ramp up. So when I say that we now, we now have um, uh, the NSF funded uh, 300 some change GPUs, we actually have in our Kubernetes infrastructure 1200 GPUs. And the rest is, is this horizontal growth. And where do all the GPUs come from? They basically people see that it reduces their total cost of ownership. They don't care about owning cloud infrastructure. They just want to own the GPUs because, and they want to have them whenever they want them. And they want to have them accessible via Kubernetes infrastructure. Voila. And then they are willing to uh, buy mostly gaming GPUs. I have, uh, I have AI researchers that own two, three racks worth of gaming GPUs because they're cheap and they're powerful. And uh, so, so NRP in a way built on something that pre-exists and never had a ramp up. It's already three times the size that it was paid for by the, NR by the NSF. And uh, we're doing all of the things that, that you've seen. Thank you very much.